so thank you very much for all the presentations that you have recorded. So we actually do have some question and I think your procedure is such, I've been sent this question by the great SVs and I will just read them and then the SVs will, will unmute the people who are supposed to ask them, such as the paper authors. So the third question is from Sriman to the Metier, the first paper. And I just read the question. You told us about solving the user recognition by only using walking pattern problems. Can you elaborate how other activities help in user recognition in this regard? Thank you. So can you please unmute the authors and, and could you provide an answer to that? Uh, can the author just raise their hand in the chat so I can unmute them? Thank you. Who is the person answering the first question? Do we have the authors online? Did you unmute them? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so um, let me just take a minute to look at the question again. Um, So, um, yes, I mentioned that in my presentation, uh, recent user recognition models only use walking, mostly only use walking data. And the fact that, oh, right. Uh, my point is that to use other activities for user recognition would be great for its application because if you can only recognize users by their walking data, then it means that your sample will be very limited. Like when the user are doing other things, you wouldn't be able to recognize their identity. So the point is the extension for user recognition from walking to other activities are important, but I'm not so sure about how other activities will be better for user recognition. Okay, thank you. Maybe um, we had another paper that had a very similar approach, right, where they were looking at joint recognition of activities and identification of, of the people. Could they, that was the weekly supervised multitask activity recognition. Um, would you care to comment about how different activities are differently well suited to, to support the process and to be recognized? Um, who is answering this question, Paul? Uh, you're muted. So these should be people who presented. So uh, Toran, Schenk, Manfred Huber were the authors of the paper. Okay. Do they have any comment on that? I mean, if not, it's fine. We can just proceed to the next question. I was just wondering you know, if there could be some discussion between two similar papers. Uh, yes, uh, I can take this question as well. Uh, I think uh, if we only use some uh, I mean, some, uh, most of the previous person identification methods, they require specific cooperation or explicit action, like uh, walking or gait recognition, like uh, standing in front of the camera, uh, looking at a specific point. So uh, using multiple or more different types of uh, activity, uh, the point is it would be better if the identification system does not require any specific inputs to complete the identification task. And uh, the sensor-based person identification uh, also provides an, an obtrusive and convenient way to do, uh, to do it to complete the task. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so the next question go, was from Alexander Hölzemann. It goes at the cross data activity, uh, data set activity rec uh, recognition uh, paper, which was Xin Quinn and uh, Kidong Chen. And the question is, maybe I missed a point. 
but did you include the node classes in the data set and how did you pre-process your data? Um, so again, the authors of the, it's the third paper, Cross Data Activity Recognition, who should answer that question? Uh, hello, everyone, can you help me? Yes. Uh, uh, for this question, uh, 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 we didn't uh, include the null classes since the, uh, uh, the null classes uh, mainly mean, mean uh, it's now uh, it's uh, have, have, have no now uh, sense. Uh, it just means uh, uh, the interval between two activities or other uh, centralized uh, uh, activities. So we didn't uh, we uh, didn't use the null classes, and uh, uh, due to the uh, limitation of our presentation. Uh, the process procedure is not uh, mentioned in detail. Uh, you can pro, uh, refer to our paper later. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for that, um, for that answer. Uh, so actually all the other questions except uh, that we have are on the Aura Ring paper. Uh, there was just one person, it was Aslan B. Wong, who obviously raised his hand during the presentation as indicating that he has a question. So, Jessica, can you see if you can unmute him if he's still there wanting to pose a question? Yeah, I don't think he's in there. Um, I'm looking for him. Um, but I don't think he's in the, in the presentation as an attendee. Um, I think we can go to the other questions. Okay, so all the other questions I had on, on link are to the Aura Ring um, paper. And there were several people who asked, can you use multiple rings at once for more complex finger motions? That was the same question I also had on my mind. So maybe you could elaborate on that. Uh, yeah, hi Paul. Um, yeah, so, um, you can, uh, the short answer is you can, but um, you can do it in two ways. One way is that, so the ring is emitting a, a, a field, for example, at 32 kilohertz, right? So one thing that you can do is that you can tune your different rings at different frequencies, right? Uh, and therefore you can have multiple rings. But uh, to be honest, I don't imagine people wanting to wear multiple rings for these kind of interactions. Uh, so what, what we were thinking about was that more of like pointing and you point a lot of times with your index finger. So that makes a lot of sense, but obviously you can add more rings. You just have to tune it to different frequencies. Could you use time domain multiplexing for that? Yeah, so that is another thing that you can um, do it, um, uh, but in able to do that, um, it's a little bit more tricky because now you have to actually have uh, we need to have uh, somehow communication with, from the ring to this like central unit so that you can time multiplex, which add to the power consumption and add to the complexity. But right now, what the ring is, it's literally just 800 turns of uh, a coil wrapped around a, 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 a case and um, just a single tone transmitting. So there's no like um, smart thing about this ring. It's certainly not a smart ring, it's just like a very dumb ring. But if you add the time multiplexing, uh, multiplexing to the ring, then adds to the complexity, to the power consumption. Um, so I think the, the tuning to different frequencies is a better option. Okay, thanks. You can just stay online. So the next, um, there are actually a couple of questions, one for Sriman, one for Sichen Bian, about let's say uh, the how susceptible the system is to various sources of interference. And I know also from our experience that if you have large metallic object, they tend to distort the, the magnetic field, they don't block it, distort it. And it would seem it can Im impact the precise tracking and then sort of other sources of inaccuracy, like moving the devices on your wrist and changing their position, and things like that. So because you have very, very nice, clean environments and clean motions in your videos, right? I mean, yeah, you yeah. Show how does it work? It's not that. So, so again, um, a key, I think, difference from uh, the traditional magnetic tracking systems was that uh, you plug something into the wall, for example, for the Bohemas, and then you kind of get that full room uh, tracking. 
Uh, but um, if there was a metal object in between or anything, it would distort the field, right? But so when you talk about like kind of what we are proposing is that typically there's not a lot of big metallic object between your wrist and your finger. And that's why I think this approach is actually makes a lot of sense, right? Um, so because of that, then, uh, and we're tuning everything to that like short range, so 15 centimeters. Um, so even if I'm interacting here, if my laptop is here, it doesn't distort the system. We have actually in the paper, we have a section that we brought uh, different electronics. So we brought like an iPhone, we brought a smartwatch, we brought a laptop close to the transmitter and the receiver. And uh, for example, um, a laptop has a, has a worse effect, but it needs to be cl very close to the transmitter or the receiver. Um, so you know, if, if I want to give you some numbers, for example, for your phone, it needs to be like three, four centimeters away um, so that we can see something on the signals that are changing. So we did not evaluate precisely, but what we were looking at is that if you bring a phone close to the transmitter or the receiver, uh, from which distance you can see visually a change in that raw data. And that's what I'm um, reporting here. Uh, but again, that's a limitation of the magnetic field, but I think it actually kind of makes sense for this particular scenario because there's not a lot of metallic object between your finger and your wrist. So just a comment on that again from, from our experience is that of course, it's not just a matter of being metallic thing between the finger and the wrist in terms of an of, you know, obstruction. As soon as you have a very large metallic thing close to the, to the magnetic field emitter, you're going to induce some, some, some strange eddy currents in there and you're going to get disruption. So it really was this thing more of, of having a metal table on which you would be doing it. So, so I do agree with that, but since the, um, the transmitter uh, strength is tuned to that 15 centimeters, right? It's very short range. So you need to even be closer to that big metallic object. Yes, yeah, so if you are interacting on top of a very big metallic object, like a desk, um, it, could, it, could, it could affect you. Um, but um, again, like we were thinking like, oh, this is like perfect for like on the go interaction. So you're on a bus, you wanna like text someone, you physically cannot bring your hands up, right? Uh, you just wanna say something on beside, with your arms motionless around, uh, uh, close to your legs, for example. So those kind of like quick on the go interactions. But that, that is very true. If there is a very big metallic object, even if you're interacting on top of it, uh, it, it might affect the signal. But again, I just want to emphasize that because we're tuning that, we're turning that transmitter um, um, strength way down, it has minimal effect. Um, there was also this other question about what happens if there is um, movement um, of the wristband itself. Um, so I think that is a, that is, that is a challenge that answers another question is that that is a challenge for all human activity recognition variables, right? So if you design a variable and you're trying to send something, if, it's, uh, if it moves on your, for example, wrist or any kind of, anywhere that's on your body, that would affect the accuracy, right? Um, so in our, this is the same thing in our system as well, is that if, if, the, if the, for example, your watch is kind of like, as you move your wrist, it rotates, um, that would affect the accuracy, obviously, but if it's, if it's tight and it doesn't change, then you would not see any difference. The other thing is that because we are tracking the relative pose of the ring with respect to the wristband, moving your wrist will not affect that signal. So if I, if I hold my hand completely still and I just like move it like this or up and down, if there's no movement on the wrist, on the wristband, right? In terms of like going back and forth or, or rotating, then you would not see any, any effect. Okay, so thanks a lot. I think we, we need to move to, to other topics. So we, don't, we, we have one more very general question from Gregory on, on this topic. I will post to the audience later if we have time. But there was a very nice question from Dan Wu uh, to the general panel. And the question is, what are the major challenges for wearable human activity recognition and device-free human activity recognition applications? What is the key enabler when bringing existing hard technology, HIR technologies to production? So I would just like, I don't know, Thomas, would you like to comment on that? Sure. Um, it's a bit of a selfish perspective, I suppose, because um, uh, most of our work is going this direction. I think the biggest challenge we have uh, when we compare to other fields like computer vision based activity recognition um, is the, you know, orders of magnitude smaller data sets uh, with labels. Um, 
if, if you look at um, computer vision based object recognition or activity recognition, we have tremendous data sets. So they are like multiple orders of magnitude larger with labels. Uh, and that allows us to, to train models like ImageNet or Inception or whatever. Um, the models we have over here, they are much, much smaller, um, mainly because we don't have uh, this amount of label training data. And I think there's, the, there's a challenge in there. It's also an opportunity um, because we are not short of unlabeled data, right? You know, everybody's phones, everybody's um, um, wristwatches or whatever, they're recording data right now. Hopefully nobody's uh, annotating right now, but rather paying attention. Um, so we are not short of unlabeled data, and there's a huge opportunity in there. And there's uh, there's there's quite interesting work coming out. Um, we've seen some here with, uh, with transfer learning and all that. Um, I think that is the that is the the, the biggest push we have at the moment. Um, the other thing is um, the the other challenge: uh, where to place the sensor. I think that's still an unsolved problem. Um, putting sensors uh, on the wrist for activity recognition is convenient uh, because we're used. Oh, let's say people my generation are used to, uh, to wristwatches. Uh, I think the, the, the next generation of students, they don't wear watches anymore, uh, but that's a convenient place. From a sensing perspective, it's not a great place. Um, where to put the sensor? Can we, can we come up with ways of uh, learning representations that are um, agnostic to the, to the sensor location? I think that's the, that's the, the biggest challenges we have at the moment. Um, transfer learning, I'm, I'm, I'm still thrilled to see that, that people work on that. Um, the, the differences between transfer learning in, again, computer vision domains and, 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 and in our domain are very striking. If you look at the uh, almost interpretability of uh, the, the individual layers in transfer learning in computer vision, uh, where you can see these beautiful edges and all that, we don't have that. So, you know, we're quickly uh, you know, overfitting, again, possibly because of the, of the small data sets. I think these are the main challenges at the moment. Yeah, thanks, Thomas. I, I would just say on my part that I very much agree with everything you said and just ask the other panelists, anybody would like to, to add something or did Thomas actually kill all this stuff with his excellent answer? Uh, can you guys hear me? Yes. Uh, I think uh, I would like to make a related point regarding the data sets. I think one uh, easy thing that computer vision has or NLP has is there's not much difference in the sensors themselves. Whereas if we look at uh, active recognition from wearables, you can have, I don't know, X number of sensors placed on different parts of the body and all of these sensors behave differently. So collecting a large enough genetic data set that would have multiple positions while functioning across different kinds of sensors is also hard, I think. So uh, it also, I think, remains to be seen how you can sort of maybe transform between the types of sensors themselves if we can't come up with sensor agnostic representations. And the number of sensors also, I think, is another big challenge that we need to deal with. We can't recognize every activity with a wrist bone sensor or a waist bone sensor or a head mounted sensor, for example. So we would need to see how best or how easily can we come up with, uh, I think, inconspicuous locations for, I think, having multiple sensors. Yes, that's, that, that, that is true. I, I also think that so the diversity of sensors, not just locations, is, is a real problem. I mean, a camera is not a camera. They also differ. But you know, the difference between contact-free sensors, that's the other topic would be something like to comment something, accelerometers, egocentric video, and magnetic is, is, is just huge. And, and that also means it's very difficult to have standardized benchmark data sets, right? Because you can have Benchmark sensor setup is much more difficult. Okay, anybody else who wants to comment? Maybe somebody from um, the audience. I mean, suppose that a pa panel, but if somebody of the audience has a comment, then of course you're welcome and it would be very nice to, to get audience people commenting on that. I think my guy also wants to speak. Yeah, of course. Yeah, okay. Uh, first of all, I agree with Thomas about the data set, but uh, uh, one point for data set, I think, is the uh, data set di uh, diversity. For example, uh, I mean, for image data set, there is uh, no much, uh, there are lots of uh, persons, lots of animals, lots of objects, uh, but for uh, HR applications, we normally only have the data set collected from, for example, uh, 10 or 20 or at least 40 persons, which is not enough because according to our appearance, um, the machine learning algorithm would perform quite different uh, to different persons. So, how to increase the data diversity also is a very important problem, I think, yeah.
Okay, thank you. So again, uh, anybody from the audience break, uh, raises a hand as a comment on that? Um, okay, so I've, uh, I have another question uh, aimed at the audience that came from Gregory. We went back to our hourling paper that seems to have been generating the most attention. And the question is, any attendees of yesterday's touch session want to comment on the comparison here with other continuous tracking solutions, uh, like one from Cornell? So again, can you look if there's any anybody from the audience who, who, who would like to say something? Okay, so doesn't seem we have more. We, we do still have some uh, some time. Um, what I'd like to stipulate is the authors of the different papers, especially we have a couple of papers that were fairly similar, like looking looking at different deep learning solutions, uh, aiming at at things like transfer learning, uh, joint learning of, of different things like identification and and activity uh, recognition, cross domain learning. Uh, it's really nice to get some comments from our one author, what they learned and what they think, how, how what they heard relate to their work on the other papers. So anybody being brave enough to, to do that at the end of the session. Uh, okay, no takers here. So I think- All right. Yeah. Sorry, I was unmuted. I was unmuted. Let, let, let me be the one who's, who's brave enough. Um, Harish, sorry about that. Um, I think what, I, what, what, what we've learned uh, is uh, we're still not there, right? So um, Harish was, uh, was modest enough to say like, you know, in two out of four data sets, uh, we, we saw improvements. Uh, in one, we saw com compatible performance. And, you know, what he didn't say is on the other one, we didn't. So that's a, that's a success rate of 50%. Um, that's, you know, in hindsight, um, I think what, what we saw there, you know, for everyone, that's the mass reconstruction uh, where we try to make use, uh, make better use of an existing data sets by, by modifying the data set. Um, the, what, what I mentioned earlier, the, 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 the challenge we have with the small data sets, that, that will stick with us for, for, for quite a while, right? So there's different approaches doing that. You know, the paper we looked at uh, was, was trying to make the most of an existing data set. We saw uh, transfer learning, we wanted to uh, pull it in uh, from, uh, from other domains, from uh, sorry, from other data sets, um, there's other approaches where folks uh, look at uh, look at other uh, modalities transferring from uh, from from video data sets towards um, sensor-based data sets. Um, I'm I'm sobered. Um, I'm you know in a way it's good because that you know at the very least gives Harish uh, enough to do for for his PhD uh, to have more contributions in there. On the other hand, um, we should probably be thinking about you know what what is what is our approach here, and it certainly is not just you know, there's deep learning. Everybody's crazy about the deep learning. Let's just use all the, the latest and the, the craziest from uh, from the deep learning community, from the from the wider machine learning or computer vision community. Deploy it in our field, and and we will be happy. We we will not, right? And I think that's that's the challenge here. So the the field of uh, sensor-based, body-worn sensor-based activity recognition is relatively unique. There are challenges that are different compared to uh, computer vision-based uh, approaches or more core machine learning-based uh, approaches. And we should embrace that. We should you know, take this as an opportunity and, and find actively trying to search and, and, and find actively uh, solutions that, that, you know, push, push the needle and get this field a bit forward. And they're interesting, uh, if you look around in, uh, here at the conference in, 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 the, in the wider field, there are interesting approaches on how to tackle these, uh, these challenges from different perspectives. Okay, and any more comments? We have Cici. And uh, one attendee that wants to speak. Yeah, so please put them on. Can you hear me? Oh, thank you very much. Um, I think it's a very good session. And uh, I see a lot of works they are trying to use in the neural network to solve the problem. And I, um, I think as we sometimes want to know which part of activity or data contributes to the classification, 
Um, maybe, for example, a, a freezing of gate activity to recognize the Parkinson's disease. So uh, I'm wondering if um, I can know if it's possible for um, our network to visualize the relationship between the uh, the network features and the uh, row sensor data. I'm wondering if uh, it, it can be realized. Um, the we can know which activity is more important to uh, some specific group of people. I think that's very important, but I think it's very hard. Thank you very much. Jessica, is there somebody else who wanted to speak? Yes, so there is uh, one of the attendees uh, raised their hands. Uh, I'll just let the, the person uh, to chat, but I don't know if the person still has the question. Um, I just asked it to unmute, uh, but I don't know. Are, are you still there? Uh, I don't think uh, okay. it no longer has a question. It's okay. In case, I see we arrive at the end of, of the session. So it's been a very, very exciting session and sort of reflecting on it also as, as, as a chair and a member of the panel. I thought looking on, on the last decades of, of activity recognition research, it was nice to see as many of the papers were really using the same standard data sets to validate, which I think is a very big improvement in, in the field. I remember a couple of years ago, we were talking about it and looking very and variously to, to computer vision where they did that and everybody was using their own self-recorded set that was not comparable. The other thing is Thomas said, I think what we are seeing is that the field is working very intensively of trying to apply the advances that deep learning in computer vision and speech has made to activity recognition. And I'm totally convinced that we will be able to do that. But obviously, as Thomas also said, it's not by just taking one-to-one -one the networks but by developing an understanding what is different in our field, how we have to adapt them. And if you look at the amazing things that those networks do in computer vision, like capture, capture you know, generating captions for, for movies and for, for pictures, I'm sure we will be able to recognize activities finally really reliably, but there's a lot of work. So it's been fun having the sessions with you guys and in the audience, thank you very much. Hopefully we can have a session soon there in person in sometime during the next decade. Thank you, bye. Um, Hey Paul, uh, I have an announcement. Uh, it's real quick. Uh, so we will be holding paper discussions and industry gatherings after the keynote today. It will start at 12 p.m. at noon in Eastern US time in Gathertown in the private gathering space. You are all welcome to join. Thank you. So thanks again also to Jessica and other steward volunteers and to everyone. And I think as was said in the beginning, there's a possibility to meet in our great um, gather app at uh, the room room c was it or something like this i i'm sure you know that i'll try to find it and not get less lost in cyberspace okay thank you very much bye